Okay, hello YouTube. Today we're going to be continuing our exploration of the Open Sicilian. And what we're going to be covering today is after e4, c5, knight f3, knight c6, d4, c, d4, knight d4. And if you're the same repertoire as me, we're going to be reaching this from the move order of queen c7. And this is going to be called the floor variation, but this is actually going to turn into, after knight c3, e6, this is going to turn into what they call the Bastrykov variation, which can, of course, also be reached from the move order uh, d4, c, d4, knight d4, e6, and then knight c3, queen c7. So basically the same thing. We can reach this from two different move orders. We can reach it from a straight Taimanov move order, or we can reach it from the floor variation move order. In either way, we're going to be playing this Bastrika variation. So before I go any further, if you like content like this and want to see more of it, please go ahead and click on that subscribe button and click on that notification icon. So the variation I'm going to be recommending here is the same move that Fischer played against Tal in Bled in 1961, which he talks about extensively in his book My Six Memorable Games. So if you want further notes on this game, I would recommend taking a look um, at that game in the book My Six Memorable Games. So that move is G3. Now the cool thing about this move G3 is it sets up a cute little trap. Well, Black has severely weakened his dark squares with the move E6 and Queen C7. And g3 prepares the move bishop f4, which will pile tons of pressure onto these dark squares. But of course, g3 has an added bonus to it, which is it's also just a good move in general. We're trying to play bishop g2 and put pressure on the center of the board. So Tao fell for this trap. He actually played the move knight f6. And of course, here's the idea. We have both a knight that can come to b5 and a bishop that can come to f4 that's going to be supported by this pawn on g3. So we can take advantage of these weakened dark squares um, with e6. So the proper move in this position instead of knight f6 is a6, which we're going to cover in a minute. But first, we'll see what Fischer did against Tau to take advantage of this mistake. So the first thing that he does is he jumps on these dark squares with tempo. He plays knight to b5 and hits the queen. And then after the queen retreats, queen b8, uh, by the way, if queen a5, bishop d2, queen d8, bishop f4, e5, bishop g5, it's going to be major advantage white. This is just up some very critical tempo in what we would see out of like a Lasker pelican or something similar to it. So instead we have queen b8. And then we have the immediate bishop f4 jumping on everything. And again, if pawn to e5, we're just going to see bishop g5. And then after a6, we're going to rip on f6 immediately. Fisher points out that you don't want to play knight a3 here because if b5, bishop f6, then b4, and black is actually doing okay. So you want to jump on this right away. You want to play bishop f6, double these pawns, and then after both a, b5, bishop g5, this should be advantage white. And also after gf6, knight a3, b5, knight d5, this is advantage white. This is just a really good version of the Lasker Pelican where um, Black just hasn't gotten his stuff underway um, the way he needs to quite yet. And white is way ahead of the game. g3 is a very useful move. g3 is actually um, the variation that I play in the Lasker Pelican. And um, doing it up several tempo is, of course, a very good feeling for me. So I would be very happy with this. Um, Tao wasn't happy with the idea of playing a Lasker Pelican several tempo down, so he went ahead and he didn't play pawn to e5, he played knight e5 and tried to block this up with pieces. This allowed Fischer to do something pretty clever here. He noticed that black had a serious problem with all of his development right here, so he took advantage of that by playing the move bishop e2. What this does is it actually prepares to ratchet up the pressure on the direct squares with the move queen d4, and then eventually castles queenside, just putting maximum pressure on all of these dark squares, putting pressure on e5, putting pressure on d6. But he couldn't play the move queen to d4 right away because the e2 square was being threatened by the knight. So he couldn't play queen d4 because knight f3 check would have forked the king and queen, and that would have won the queen. So he had to prep it with the move bishop e2. And he didn't really care so much if black played a6, because if he did, his intention was basically just to play queen d4. Um, just play it anyway, because there isn't really a good move here. If, for example, d6, we could play something like rook d1, a b5, bishop e5, would be major advantage white. You can't take this bishop because of queen d8 mate. So uh, Tal saw this. He didn't want any part of it. So he played bishop c5, just trying to prevent the move queen to d4. 
and um, Fisher pounced in the middle of the board, he immediately captured. So this is one of those things that you don't do unless you have something very specific in mind. You don't typically want to break your opponent's pins unless you have something specific in mind, which of course Fisher did. His idea was is that he's going to be playing f4 and e5 very quickly, and he's going to be gaining control of that d6 square, and he's going to be pushing black out of the middle of the board. So then we have queen takes e5, f4, queen b8, e5, sticking to the plan, a6, and then uh, Fisher doesn't let Tal off the hook with any slack moves in this position. Um, he goes ahead and says, if you want my knight on b5, you can have it. I'm going to get a super dangerous pawn on g7. So he goes ahead and goes in for these exchanges, gets that super dangerous pawn, and finds a way to keep it. And this is what's critical. He plays knight e4 with the idea of knight f6 that forces bishop e7, and then that queen comes to d4. It holds the pawn, prepares knight f6, prepares to improve his position, and prepares continuing improvements of his position. So Tao tries the best he can to kind of keep everything together with the few pieces that he can maneuver. He plays rook a4, and as you can see, he has difficulties here because he only has a couple pieces that he can maneuver at all, like the bishop on e7 and the rook on a4, and meanwhile he has two pieces that are completely trapped behind the lines, this bishop on c8 and this rook on g8. It makes Tal's position very difficult to defend, but meanwhile white has freedom of development of all of his pieces, and Fisher has to play very accurately because Tal plays very accurately. So he plays knight of 6 check, Bishop takes f6, queen takes f6, and then queen c7. He goes ahead and castles queenside. And again, it, it seems anti-instinctual to give up this pawn. But again, when you're playing against a guy like Tao, you can't play any slack moves. You have to just play extraordinarily accurate chess in order to beat the guy. So rook a2, king b1, rook a6. And then we had uh, bishop takes b5, rook g6, bishop back to d3. So now Fisher's setting up a really crucial threat. He's threatening bishop takes h7, which would basically end the game on the spot. So Tao finds the one and only defense. He plays e5, and he puts pressure on the queen. So this is something Fisher points out. If he had played a really safe move here, like queen takes e5, after queen e5, f e5, rook g7, Tao's probably going to save this game. Um, he has the queens off the board, and he's going to get enough time to develop his final pieces, and he's going to get out of this in one piece. So it was really critical after e5 that he just continue keeping up the pressure on Tal's position and taking advantage of the fact that black can't develop his pieces, and he sacrificed his queen. He played fe5. And then after rook f6, gf6, he has the freedom of development of all of his pieces, and meanwhile Tal can't develop. Now even winning from here against Tal was really hard. Um, Tal actually managed to force Fisher into a two rook versus a queen position, uh, where Fisher had the extra pawns, and, and he made Fisher prove it. Um, but the rest of the game went kind of down Fisher's path. You know, he got everything that he wanted out of the position. He got the rooks to the seventh rank. He harassed the king. He picked up that last pawn eventually, and he started creating serious pressure in this position. Notice he's got three extra pawns here. Um, the result of the game shouldn't be in doubt at this point. And he just um, kept pressing until finally Tao was forced to resign. And if you want more um, information about that game, again, it's in Fisher's book, My 60 Memorable Games. He gives his own thoughts and his own narrative on exactly what was going on and exactly what he was thinking in that game. And I would recommend getting that book and looking it up um, and seeing everything that happened. So I do recommend that line against um, the move knight f6. I recommend what Fisher played. It holds up today pretty well. So the question is, what do you do if they play the main line, if they play a6? Well, the positional grounding in this opening is pretty solid. The first thing you do is you just develop. You play bishop g2, and you focus on d5. And then after knight f6, you just castle. And then after bishop e7, you just play the move rook to e1. So you're just continuing to focus your energy on this d5 square. You're continuing to focus all of your stuff on d5 because control of d5 in the Sicilian is really important. And it's really important because it prevents black from ever playing like an early d5 in this position. But in general, the main idea here is we don't develop our queen side right away because we just don't know where this bishop and rook belong quite yet. And we wait for black to kind of tell us what he's going to do in the middle of the board with either castles kingside or d6 here, both of which are the main line. And in both of these cases, I would say that you're going to be playing knight c6 and e5. Now, black has to be careful. He has to avoid some pitfalls here. If he plays something like uh, b5, you would immediately get some sort of major advantage with the move pawn to e5, just taking advantage of all these pins and taking advantage of the fact that you have this very dangerous diagonal here 
on g2 to a8 that he has to be cautious about. So if uh, castles, the main move here is just knight c6, bc6, we're going to play e5, put that pressure on the middle. Knight d5, and then we're going to have um, this game that we're going to be following is uh, Tivyakov versus um, Raman that was played in 1994. That game went queen g4, f5, queen c4, queen b6, knight a4, bishop back to f1, queen e4, and you can just kind of start seeing some of the themes here. Eventually, white does find a home for his bishop. It belongs on the long diagonal, and you can just see he has this extra space, and he has these extra weaknesses over here that he's exploiting, and um, these small advantages are accumulating. And they're basically, this position is now just advantage white. And he can just press in this position just all day long. You know, rook d1, putting pressure on that weakness. Rook e4, just activating the pieces, etc. White was slightly better in this position, and, well, probably even more than slightly better, probably already. This is major advantage white. We've got two weaknesses to play with, and we've got more space. And uh, Tivyakov went on to win against Raman in 1994. Um, in this particular game. So the other direction um, that this can go other than uh, castles after rook e1 is they can play d6 and after the move d6 you would ostensibly do the same thing. You would play knight c6, b c6, e5 and then you've kind of got a cute move here available to you. If they play d takes e5 you just take it. You just play rook takes e5 and you're just taking advantage of the fact that you have this beautiful um, light squared diagonal that they really just can't do anything about. They can't play the move. Um, they The main move is castles, but of course they can't play the move queen takes e5 here because you've got bishop c6 um, on lock. So they give you give up that rook, but you're getting this rook. And not only are you getting that rook, but they are um, losing um, a certain amount of... Uh, they're, they, they could potentially be losing... Um, more than just um, the rook on a8. They could be losing other stuff on top of that. But basically, you lost the rook, they're losing this pawn, and they're going to be losing this rook. This is this is basically just advantage white. So you can play rook takes e5, and then after castles, you're just going to play bishop f4, uh, queen b7, and then I would say the main move here is just pawn to b3. It protects that pawn, and it just gives white a nice little uh, slight edge. So knight d5, we have knight d5, dc5, rook e1, uh, bishop b4, bishop d2, bishop g4, queen g4, bishop d2, rook e2, bishop c3, rook d1, rook fe8, rook d3. Just running through this game that was actually played, um, a5, h4. This position is slight edge white, and um, the game that we're following here is... Um, Adams versus uh, Sadler, and uh, this did eventually end in a win for White. This was actually slight edge White, and it did end up going pretty well. But those are basically your primary options in this line uh, after you play the move g3, and they play the move pawn to a6. You're going to be developing bishop g2, castles kingside, rook e1 um, in the main lines focusing all that energy on the d5 square, and pretty much almost anything they do, you're going to be playing uh, knight c6, and you're going to be following that up with e5 against the two main moves, against castles kingside and against um, pawn to d6. Of course, against certain types of mistakes, like against pawn to b5, you're going to be playing um, e5 immediately. Um, but basically, this is the main idea here of these positions. And these positions should be considered um, slight advantage white. This should be a pretty reasonable way uh, to play against uh, this particular uh, variation, um, whether you reach this variation out of the floor setup or whether you reach it out of the time enough variation. So anyways, I hope you found this, very, uh, this video helpful. I hope you learned something new about chess, and I hope you learned some ideas that you can use in your own games. Uh, thank you very much for watching.